We gather this hour. We gather this hour. We gather this hour. We gather this hour as people of faith. As people of faith. As people of faith. As people of faith. With joys and sorrows. With joys and sorrows. With joys and sorrows. Gifts and needs. Gifts and needs. Gifts and needs. We light this beacon of hope. We light this beacon of hope. We light this beacon of hope. Sign of our quest for truth and meaning. Sign of our quest for truth and meaning. In celebration. In celebration. In celebration. Of the life we share together. 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 We share together. We share together. We share together. Yes. So sometime, it was around 1994, I think, 1994, 1995. I saw a black box theater production of Hamlet. Now, I must confess that I have never been a huge Shakespeare fan. From much of my youth, I was pretty sure the only point of Shakespeare was to torture high school students with difficult, opaque language spoken in distant ages and settings. As a teenager, I never really got the jokes and I could barely hang on for the general plot. And while I suppose I could appreciate the importance of the bard, old William's stories never really hooked me. And I think maybe there's three general categories of Shakespeare folks. There are the ones who have read all the plays and poetry and who swoon in every In the Park production. And then there are those who have zero appetite for 400 year old plays and find them opaque and irrelevant. And there are those of us sort of in between like me who can appreciate the art up to a point but find it too cognitively demanding to truly understand what the heck the big deal is. So anyway, in 1994, I'm in Urbana, Illinois I'm in graduate school, and I found myself giving Hamlet another try. Elizabethan costumes and all, this is what I was expecting. And maybe, I was hoping, maybe this time I would figure out what my high school teacher was going on about all those years. So we're in the theater and the lights go down on the audience and up on the stage. And I unexpectedly found myself untethered untethered from time. You see, the director of this production of Hamlet had unhooked Hamlet from its historical time and put it into the then now, the now of that case being, she placed Hamlet right in the midst of the Bosnian war, which was still raging in late 1994. Complete, the characters were completely dressed in contemporary military fatigues that carry AK-47, fake AK-47s and M-16s. And yeah, the language is the same and the plot was exactly the same, but somehow, for me, that shift in time made the entire production, the entire play, the entire story much more relevant, much more urgent. And I admit, I still didn't fully understand all the dialogue, but somewhere in there, I began to discover for myself the truth about this play. The truth that um, there's a critic named Elizabeth Rosner and she wrote about Hamlet. She said, Hamlet reveals our simultaneous blending of genius and self-sabotage, our capacity for love and hate, for creativity and destruction. In that moment, for me, Hamlet suddenly became relevant, all because the story got unhitched from time. So this month, as, as, as you came into the room today, both with our music selections and, and um, 
uh, in our opening of our chalice lighting. Um, you may have surmised this month's Soul Matters ministry theme is story. And as many of you probably know, I'm all about the stories, how we form and are formed by stories, and how stories shape our understanding of ourselves and the world around us. How stories can ground us in deep, life-giving and life-sustaining relationships, and also how stories can shatter those same relationships. So a couple quick notes about how I understand story and how I talk about story. So first of all, I believe that all stories are true and no story is completely factual. And I think there is an important, perhaps subtle difference between fact and truth. Let me give you an example. My favorite biblical story is in Genesis, and it's the story where Jacob wrestles with the angel or with God. It's a little ambiguous of who he's actually wrestling with, but he does this all night long, this wrestling match all night long on the banks of the Jabbok River, and at the end of which he is blessed and his name is changed to Israel. Okay, so I don't think the story is factual in that it represents an actual historical event, and I can't even be sure. In fact, I'm pretty sure that Jacob was never an actual person in history. Maybe he was, but there's no real evidence of that. But the power of that story of Jacob wrestling all night with the angel on the banks of the Jabbok, the power of that story does not hinge on whether or not Jacob lived, existed, or whether or not this wrestling match ever existed. But I do think the story is true in that it carries a deep truth about the human condition, about lonely dark nights and existential fights that nearly everyone I have ever met can relate to. Mostly I know that story is true because I have been in that place where Jacob was full of fear and loneliness and struggling against powerful forces that I neither understand nor wish to surrender to. And also I hear the story of Jacob every time I bear witness to someone's struggle, for example, with addiction or a struggle with their identity or even a struggle with their everyday relationships. So whether the story, whatever story is about Jacob or it could be about, I don't know, Elizabeth Bennett or Helen Keller or Luke Skywalker or Michelle Obama or George Floyd, or about your best friend. Remember, all stories are true and probably none of them are wholly factual. One of the things though about our personal stories, the stories we tell about ourselves to ourselves and to our loved ones is that we there tend to be hitched, as I say, hitched to time. For example, if I were to tell you the story about how Caroline, my wife, Caroline and I met, I would tell you about when we were in college together in the late 1980s. And while that might be an interesting story, perhaps even amusing for you, it's not likely one that would leave you with a profound truth about the human condition. More likely, it would trigger your memories of the late 1980s, if you were around then, or your memories of college or your college ages or your memories of how you met the love of your life. My story about how I met my wife would be tethered in time and your likely response to it would be tethered as well. Like I said, interesting maybe, but unlikely to be offering you a truth in any useful way. And so I began to wonder if this tethering of our stories in time limits their transformative power, and what happens when we unhitch the story from that tether. There is a phrase that is deeply familiar, I'm sure, to all of you, a phrase that is almost magical in its power. It's the phrase that begins many a fairy tale, many a story, once upon a time. 
I invite you to feel what happens when you hear those four words, to notice how the energy in your body responds, how your attention is drawn to what comes next. There is this kind of knowing in our bones that is aroused with those words once upon a time. And I think perhaps that inherent knowing is the body's way of listening for the transformative truth that can arrive with what follows those words. I think that once upon a time untethers a story from time. Once upon a time could be yesterday. Once upon a time could be a decade ago or 400 years ago. With once upon a time, the time becomes irrelevant. The time becomes now, becomes present. Once upon a time unhooks Hamlet from being an early 17th century Danish prince or even a 13th century Danish prince, depending on when you understand the story to been placed. And it lets us put that story at any time. And in so doing, we can discover its deeper truths of our capacity for creation and destruction, love and hate. Once upon a time unhooks Jacob from an ancient Hebrew, perhaps 1800 year BC narrative and allows us to wrestle that angel or God at any time, at this time, and perhaps be transformed by that encounter. Once upon a time unhooks Caroline in my meeting for the first time in the 1980s and lets that a story occur any time. Two people meet and form a deep and abiding relationship. Once upon a time places our story in the canon of your story. So I wanna invite you all into a kind of an interesting practice that I'd like you to do for the next at least week or so, if not the whole month as we explore stories. With every story that you tell in the coming days and weeks, the story about your day at work or the story about the cashier at the grocery, or the story about that guy in the park with the dog. Begin each of those stories with those four words. Once upon a time, once upon a time, there was a guy in the park with a dog. Once upon a time, there was a cashier at the grocery store. And two, with every story you read, for example, the stories you read in the newspaper, whether you actually get a newspaper or read online, begin reading it as if those were the first four words. Once upon a time, the president spoke to Congress. Once upon a time, the Eagles drafted a wide receiver in the first round. Once upon a time, a baby was born on a flight from Salt Lake City to Honolulu. And as you play with this practice, as you do this once upon a time, and really, I truly invite you into this. We, um, I've been playing with this all weekend. As you play with this practice, notice how those words, once upon a time, how those words shift, how you hear the story that follows, and how you tell the story, how you feel the story. Notice too the ways once upon a time transforms your everyday storytelling and story listening. The ways that phrase opens the story beyond its facts to its deeper truths, deeper meanings in your life. Once upon a time, there was a congregation that invited me to awaken to love. It's a good story, and someday I hope you tell it to me. Amen, my friends, and I love you, and may we live in blessing.